A large reason why so many building companies do not produce monthly financial reports is because when they go into QuickBooks or Xero or whatever accounting software they use, when they look at their profit and loss on a monthly basis, it goes up and down in terms of gross profit. One month they might have had a stellar month in terms of profitability and the next month they're making a loss and that makes no sense. Are you struggling to grow your construction company? Trying to navigate all the challenges that come with it? Well, if you do, stick around because today we have a special guest, Russ Stevens, who has been helping construction business owners manage their businesses more effectively. Thank you for joining me today, Russ. Would you mind uh, telling us a little bit about what you do? Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Excited to, uh, to be here and have this chat with you today. So... I'm a co-founder of the Association of Professional Builders, which is a business coaching company purely for residential home builders, primarily focused on building new homes or large remodeling projects. And we operate with uh, builders across the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Been doing this for 10 years now. That is wonderful. Um... Can you give us a little bit more feedback on uh, what you help uh, construction companies achieve? Sure. Well, building company owners typically come to us because they want to generate more leads because more leads leads to more sales, which leads to more cash flowing into the building company, which they then believe will, will solve a lot of problems. However, the reality is a lot of building companies are simply not set up to be scaled profitably. So we always start by looking at their profitability, identifying any issues with their profits, fixing those, helping the builder to understand the kind of margins that they really do need to be working on. And then we work with them to improve their marketing so that they are generating a lot more leads than they can actually service which then enables them to not only scale up but increase their margins as well and uh and, and from there it's an ongoing pro uh, process where we typically take building companies to 10 million dollars plus in annual revenue but we do it at 10 percent net profit margin which uh for a builder doing new construction that typically means they're marking up their jobs by 33 percent and uh and if they're primarily focused on remodeling projects they're marking up by 55 percent yeah it has to be there has to be a good foundation before you start generating leads that's what i always say you don't need to be worried about the you know the first line your revenue line as much as you want to worry about the bottom line because just the fact that you're making 10 million in revenue doesn't really matter if you're not making any profit margins out of it um now me being in financial industry for construction companies like being their accountant i definitely firsthand know how important the financial literacy is for the builders to make any sort of informed decisions really for their business um, and maximize profits. And the biggest reason I have decided to work with, with construction businesses only is because I saw a huge gap in them understanding their numbers. I saw that they're struggling to see, are my projects profitable? Am I making any money? Is my overhead eating into my profits? I mean, looking at the report that um, you sent me and we discussed, um, it's shocking that it says that 92.4% of builders are looking at inaccurate financial reports. Um, there are still not enough builders monitoring their gross profit margins on projects by, you know, on a monthly basis not even understanding the difference between the markups and margins um what was the other statistics i liked um 52.3 percent of builders produced uh, um monthly financial reports that's only half of all the builders that is uh that is shocking to me i knew there was a big gap but i didn't realize it was so world spread yeah, a lot of this stuff, we kind of intuitively know that there's a problem 
and it's not where it should be. But uh, seeing seeing those problems in numbers it is quite confronting, isn't it? And there's a lot of reasons uh, behind those numbers as well. A large reason why so many building companies do not produce monthly financial reports is because when they go into QuickBooks or Xero or whatever accounting software they use, when they look at their profit and loss on a monthly basis, it goes up and down in terms of gross profit. One month they might have had a stellar month in terms of profitability and the next month they're making a loss. And that makes no sense. And because it makes no sense, they tend to stop looking at it and then they focus on cash. And that is incredibly dangerous, especially for a company primarily focused on new construction where cash flow is actually positive. So the fact that you've got a couple of hundred thousand dollars in the bank or, or even more, that is no indication of your profitability. You know, profit is not cash and cash is not profit. So you've got to understand where those hidden liabilities are that aren't currently sitting in your accounts. They're sitting outside your accounts. And if you're not doing that calculation, you uh, not only are kidding yourself as to how profitable you are, but you're also overpaying in your taxes as well. We've got numerous examples of that. But to touch on your, your other shocking statistic, which uh, it kind of like, it puts a shiver through me every time you say it, 92% of builders looking at inaccurate financial reports. So I guess there's two sides to this as well. Half of those builders know that their financial reports aren't accurate because they openly tell us in the survey they do not know how to calculate work in progress. Therefore, they, they already understand to a certain degree that their financial reports are not accurate. Um, but more concerning is there's roughly about 45% of builders that think they know how to calculate work in progress, but we have this as a two-stage question. We ask them if they understand it, and the ones that say yes, we then test them. And what we find is the vast majority, it's something like 80% of those guys have got the calculation wrong, which means it's even more dangerous because I think it's one thing knowing what you don't know, but when you don't know what you don't know, that is when you get into serious, serious trouble. So that's the, the kind of frightening part about our industry. That is what we're, we're striving to, so hard to fix and uh, doing it with the help of people like yourself who understand the residential construction industry and are helping to correct builders' financials. I agree with all of it. Uh, work in progress has been almost like a set of words that a lot of builders try to avoid just because they don't understand it. And a lot of um, bookkeepers actually that uh, I had clients coming from, they had no idea what that means either or how to set it up or how to track it at all. And um, it is it can get you in trouble real fast. I knew a lot of people who overpaid on taxes because they were allocating all that um, revenue that they, you know, didn't earn yet. And uh, there were so many other missed opportunities. But I also wonder, you mentioned um, having good leads and um, contractors constantly, you know, looking to expand on that. In your experience, how does effective marketing contribute to the profitability of construction business? Yeah, well, again, in the report, there's a, it, it was quite amazing how many builders spend so, li so, so little, really, on marketing and advertising. And the statistic that we have been talking about for a long, long time now is the percentage of revenue that needs to be reinvested back into marketing and advertising in order to generate surplus demand, which will then enable you to, to scale up profitably. And that figure is 3%. And the great thing about the report that we produced each year is it fully backs up that number because when we use AI to analyze the data and cross-reference the builders that are actually investing or reinvesting 3% of their revenue back into marketing and advertising, we can see that these guys not only have higher gross margins that you'd expect, but they also have higher net margins. Now, what that means is even though they are investing a full 3% of their revenue, yeah, which is a large chunk of the gross profit, back into generating even more leads, they've still got more coming out the bottom in terms of retained net profit. So it's clear evidence that uh, marketing, or sorry, margins are linked to marketing. And uh, 
I guess the other side to that is once you've spent, it's not just a case of spending money because, you know, if you're running a, a $10 million building company, we're talking about a $300,000 a year investment, $25,000 a month. That, that can be quite shocking to uh, a lot of people to hear that. But, you know, the data proves that this is the key. But it's not just a case of spending the money, obviously. We've got to be generating the, the right leads. So we've got to be working with the right agencies, the agencies, just like bookkeepers and accountants, that understand the residential construction industry. You know, don't waste your time or money working with agencies that don't understand our industry. But when you work with the right agencies uh, that understand our industry, the key, the absolute key to generating quality leads in this industry is content marketing and you, you've got to be doing that because it is a game changer it's what we've seen so many of our members use in order to to really increase their margins and scale up their businesses and, and we are, we're, we're actually coaching over 780 building companies in five countries at the moment so we've got a lot of data that we see so you know we we know this is a fact but content marketing and by content marketing i'm talking about blog articles videos that might go out on youtube and facebook social media posts email campaigns which provides good quality information educating the consumer and when you educate the consumer you become the expert the authority in the space that builds trust and authority and uh, and that is a massive factor in generating high margin contracts and it is i saw how hard it is for the guys to start accepting the fact that you have to be on social media they're just so passionate about what they do. They want to build, they want to create, they want to be on job site. And when you tell them that you got to go post on YouTube and on LinkedIn and all that, they just resist it. <laughs> but that is yeah. what's, it's just the reality nowadays. That's all there is to it. Yeah, um, look, it's a harsh reality, isn't it? Because if you do prefer to be a technician, in your building company, the reality is you're, you'd be way better off going and working for someone else because chances are you're working way too hard and long for too little working for yourself if you're not doing all these things. Because as a, the owner of a building company, you've got to transition out of the technician role, the doing role, which so many guys are passionate about and love. And you've got to transition into a different role with, as a business owner where you're looking at your marketing, you're looking at your sales, your operations, etc. So you've got to step away from that Day to day and if you're passionate about doing then you would be way better off going and working for someone else you'd work a lot less hours you'd have a lot of stress you'd have a, a much happier life <laughs> yes i agree with that one it's uh it's hard for i just had a call with uh, a potential client and he said that he loves what he does but he got a really bad diagnosis and he got sick and he got a disability so that pushed him to become a business owner instead of doing all the work. And I'm thinking, what a terrible thing that it had to have happened to you to realize it. And I always say, you know, when you pay yourself, it's so little that if something was to happen to you, you get hit by a bus, God forbid, you would have to pay somebody to do all the 17 jobs that you have been performing. But how can you pay them? You can afford to pay them because you never paid yourself that much. And that is, I mean, I feel like building systems and processes, it is what helps you to go from the technician in your business to the actual business owner that can grow the company. Um, in your opinion, how can builders establish effective systems and streamline the processes to really scale? What, what's your experience with that? Well, yeah, that's a bit like how do you eat an elephant? It's uh, you got to you got to have an elephant burger every day and uh, work your way through. But uh, in terms of getting started with these systems and processes, the the very first step is to create a process for creating processes. So yeah, you get that one knocked over, and then you start building out from there. But uh, with systems and and at the moment we're now. We're now working with a lot of building companies that have become fully systemized and, uh, and very organized, but now they're taking that next step into how do they now bring AI into their building company. And it's very similar to how you get started with systemizing in the first place. 
where you've got to look at what's happening at the moment. We like to start with a, a three-step process. We call it DAD. So delete, automate, delegate. Look at what you are currently doing. Does it even need to be do, uh, done? Because a lot of the time we find ourselves doing stuff, you know, kind of almost out of habit. But when we look at it objectively, does it really affect the operation of our building company? Things evolve. Sometimes we find ourselves, or even our staff, you know, that's where it's more common, doing things that don't need to be done. So they can be deleted. Um, next, can we automate it with the you know, uh, current systems, automation systems that are already in the marketplace, you know, not even looking at AI, but the, you know, the more simple ones. And if we can automate it, we've got to put the time in because that's working on our business. That's uh, really high leverage time to automate. And if we can't do either of those, then we've got to look, well, who can we delegate it to? Because like you just uh, alluded to there, once we understand our hourly rate, and uh, for most builders, it is that aren't systemized, it is way too low. You know, if you look at how much you draw out your building company and you look at how many hours you're working on average a week, and, uh, and then you calculate your hourly rate based on that, it's a bit of a shock when you compare it to what you're paying your employees and even your subcontractors. Yeah, that can be a bit of a wake up call. But when you look at that, uh, that hourly rate, and you know, if you're working 80 hours a week, that's not sustainable, you've got to bring that down. Then it gives you a good idea about, well, what is this task? How long is it gonna take? How much could I pay someone to do that? I can get that off my plate and you start getting rid of all the stuff that you don't particularly enjoy doing, which makes work a lot more enjoyable and you keep working through that process, DAD, um, until you free up more and more time and uh, and then a lot of opportunities will open up because uh, once you've got more time, you start looking at things, you start planning strategically way, way better. Yeah, I like that strategy. Um, I had a business coach, well, I have a business coach who taught me the buyback rate you got to calculate because a lot of businesses when they just start out they're too scared to delegate anything hire any help because they think they cannot afford it well calculate what you can afford and then go find some help it doesn't have to be 20 employees at once just start delegating one by one um and like you said delete the tasks that you can't um that doesn't have to happen. It's all about assessing what exactly are you spending your time um, on and how can you free up that time in order to, you know, either acquire more skills or focus more on leadership or other million things that really business owners do. Um, yeah. And I think I like talking about hourly rates as well, because it's not just about how much money you can earn out of your building company. Yeah, the flip side of that is balance, isn't it? And spending less time working. Yeah, which is why you got into business in the first place, isn't it? It's not to work 60 hours a week. Yeah, really, as the owner of a successful building company, you want to be working 30 hours a week. Yeah, maybe some guys like even less. And that might sound quite shocking to a lot of people, but that's the reality of scaling. You know, if you if you take your building company to 10 million plus, you can actually work a lot less hours. Um, there's one example comes to mind of one of our members. We started working with him six years ago. He'd had enough. He was about to give up, throw the towel in. And really, it was the last throw of the dice that he came to us. And at that time, when I look back now, I, I, I can see he was actually earning $83.33 was his hourly rate, you know, which is you know, not entirely shocking. It's not even unusual, really, because it's, uh, it's kind of quite common for a lot of guys to be earning that amount. But now he's gone from where he was then to running, uh, well, it was a 10 million, it's now a $15 million building company. He's got his margins to a level uh, where his hourly rate has gone right up. But additionally, he, he's systemized his business so much, he's only working 30 hours a week. So his hourly rate is a staggering $1,500 an hour. You know? And I think when you compare that $83.33 to $1,500, and he's done that in six years, and when you see this guy talking at uh, our events, yeah, we have like an annual retreat uh, where we take a few builders away. We're off to Fiji um, very soon. We have a, a summit, we have members dinners, you know, around the US, Canada and Australia. When these builders come together and talk, we realize that these guys are earning exceptional amounts and are exceptionally successful in business. 
they're just like them. There's nothing extraordinary about them when they get to talk to them. They really, it's the, well, the, the thing that's extraordinary is the, 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 the burning desire and the sheer tenacity and hard work they're prepared to put in. But they didn't go to university or anything like that or study business. They, they, they came the exact same path that most builders come through. They were apprentices. They, um, they started their own carpentry teams. They then naturally progressed into building and, and that's where they kind of got caught out. But once they've got the fundamentals uh, under their belt, they can be extremely successful because builders, as we know, are so hardworking. You combine that with the knowledge and uh, success is incredible what they can achieve. I agree with that. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you, I personally, have noticed that, you know, building a team and um, this whole human resource management issue has been a really big challenge for builders. Um, do you have any strategies um, that builders can implement to optimize their workforce and uh, keep their team, you know, happy uh, for a long time? Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, particularly in the US, labor has been a, uh, a, a big challenge. Uh, even before COVID, it was a massive problem, particularly in the US compared to other countries like Canada and Australia. And, uh, and then we went through COVID where labor became a problem for everyone. You know, it was so bad that you know, it wasn't even talked about as a, as a big issue because it was just kind of accepted that everyone you know, struggled with employment. And, uh, and now things are settling back down to normality. We can still see that uh, you know, employment is a big problem, for, you know, particularly for builders in the US. But the thing is, with any, like any problem, if you continue doing the same thing, and expecting uh, a different result yeah you're going to be disappointed you know you've got to do something different and although i would say labor and recruiting people is a global problem and it affects all industries it's still a problem that can be solved because all we've got to do we've got to be better than anyone else to solve the problem and to do that we've got to have a strong company culture and you can do this because when you develop a strong company culture, which is built on core values, you actually attract better people into your company. It makes it easier to retain better people as well. And then you will actually find, believe it or not, there are construction companies out there that have a wait list of people wanting to work for them. Imagine that in this current environment, having a list of people who are waiting that uh, have been already been vetted as well you know they are quality people that want to come and work for you when the positions uh, open up but that all comes from having a strong company culture which uh, which then rolls into having a systemized recruitment process but also looking after people in the right way which doesn't mean showering them with, with money you know there are different strategies to that but when you do this you can solve that labor problem those are great tips uh, company culture is something that you think could be very gimmicky, just uh, words, but in reality, that is what kind of keeps everyone glued together. It's a strategy, isn't it? Company mm -hmm. culture is a strategy. It's, and, and it's like core values really drive a company uh, culture. And it's not a case of you know, sitting down thinking, well, what's our core values? You know, integrity, <laughs> you know, quality, innovation. Yeah, you know, it's not about that. It's, uh, it's going deeper than that and understanding what are the real drivers. I mean, to give you an example of that, um, some of our values at APB are we never make assumptions, we ask more questions. This is so important to us in how our team operates. You know, someone might say, oh, your website's down, for instance. Um, yeah, we don't hit the panic button and uh, get operations involved. The website's down. It's like, really? We are, what are you clicking on? Yeah, let me check that you know, for myself. Yeah, it's, it sounds simple, but if you've got that thought process every time, and, and that rolls over to our coaching as well. You know, uh, our coaches might be working with a builder. Well, I, I need more. I need more leads. Yeah, well, that, tell me more about that. Let's go deeper. We might find that, uh, no, they've got plenty of leads. They've just got the wrong quality. So it comes down to either their, you know, their marketing and who they're targeting um, or, or what they're saying, or maybe they're, they're not attracting the right kind of people. So, yeah, we just got to ask more questions all the time and, um, and go deeper. Another one, you know, just as an example, we don't say integrity at APB. 
we say we always do the right thing even when no one else is looking. Um, so, you know, our company, we've got employees all over Australia, Canada and the US, everyone works remotely. And uh, we're reliant on good people, you know, doing the right thing when no one else is looking. Yeah, you know, it's a big part of our culture, but that can apply to a builder as well. Yeah, you know, you've got multiple sites, you've got not only staff, but you've got subcontractors, they have to buy into your core values. So the people that work for your building company, do they always do the right thing, even when no one else is looking? You know, it's what they're doing when they when they can't be seen. Because when someone violates your core values, that's what you pull them back to, whether it's an employee or a subcontractor, like this isn't congruent with what our building company is all about. And once people start to understand how important your core values are they buy, and, and they buy into them, that's when you start to see a massive change in your operations. And you've got to live by your core values because the core values for a building company are absolutely everything. But when you do, the, the rewards are incredible. You can really change things around. I like your values. I might steal them for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, working all over US, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, have you noticed any new trends emerging in construction? Um, I'm trying to understand how builders can adapt to the new changes this year. Yeah, there's a couple of really big things that are happening right now in construction. What we are seeing, uh, and I think it's being led in the US, I would probably say, you know, and, and Canada, I, I think those two countries are a fair bit ahead of Australia at the moment, but it's off-site construction is, is something that's growing and it's, uh, it's only going to get bigger over the next few years. So I think that's something to be really aware of are the the benefits of of having more and more stuff done off site and brought uh, and brought to site um, there's a, a lot of cost benefits there it's the way the industry is going the other thing that we've got to be aware of at this moment in time is the effect of ai on our industry and just how fast it is hitting our industry because we've been amazed at the adoption of ai by our members um, the way they've uh, they've moved into it so quickly. Uh, AI is a massive part of marketing now. If you're not using AI to manage your marketing and help with your marketing, you are doing a lot of work uh, unnecessarily. That can really compress the amount of work that you have to do. Yeah, even in different aspects, uh, like uh, like your sales, it's it's a little bit rough around the edges at the moment, but we are literally months away from AI making outbound and handling inbound uh, sales calls for us. Uh, and when I say we're, we're months away, it's at a level where it's so natural, you wouldn't even notice the difference. Um, that's how close we are. So if we're not aware of that, uh, our building company is not going to be able to compete with the, the builders that understand this. In terms of estimating, you can literally, you can upload uh, a set of plans into ChatGPT and ask for a takeoff. It'll come back in seconds. Um, it's quite incredible what this technology can do. And the, the danger is if we miss out on it, if we're not aware of, uh, of uh, the benefits and the functionality that it can do, other builders are aware and they are using it. And with, literally within two years, you'll be so far behind that your costs will be exorbitant. And I, I don't think the cost ratio is going to change for a building company. At the moment, the fixed expense ratio has sits around 15%. And it's probably been like that for decades. And if we look to the future, I don't see that changing. But I see the current cost structure drop into way below 15. But what that means is builders are going to spend a, a larger percentage on other components. We don't even know what those components are at this stage, but it's going to give those building companies an edge over the builders that continue to do it the old way. So if we look back decades when computer computerization came into business, the, the companies that didn't adapt and evolve, you know, fell by the wayside. Uh, with any technology that's hit us, the internet, you know, for example, you know, if you if you didn't adapt, you know, if you didn't take on cloud-based software, for instance, you know, you you found it very hard to compete against the companies that were organised, and those companies also had a great point of difference because they had client communication, online portals, etc. So, if you do not adapt to this new technology hitting our industry, yeah, you, you you're going to get crashed, unfortunately. Yeah, the AI is going to swallow you unless you 
know how to tame it and use for your advantage. Crazy. Yeah, we always say to staff, you know, AI is not going to replace you, but someone using AI will. So, Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're, we're spending a lot of money educating and training our team because we want them to be empowered and, and more productive. And, um, yeah, we, we want these guys, help these guys to evolve. And uh, Richard Branson, you know, he said, uh, train your people well enough that they could go and work for anyone but treat them well enough that they don't want to. So uh, I think that's a good thing to keep in mind as well. But it's not just employees, it's building companies. You know, AI isn't going to replace your building company, but a building company using AI will. So sleep with one eye open, guys, because the future is coming. That is so crazy, the times we're living in. <laughs> well, thank you, Russ, for sharing your insights and strategies for navigating all these challenges that the guys are facing. Um, I hope it was very uh, insightful. And um, if uh, you guys have any questions, you know you can leave comments and we'll get back to you. Otherwise, I will leave some details for some other helpful information uh, that Ross has provided. And um, we'll see you on the other side.